Uh, this kind of in line is very much in line with that concept. Uh, we are going to talk about one of the other methods of artificial lift, which is gas lift system. Um, so the objective is that I will just quickly reiterate some of the artificial lift systems that we use in the industry and where the gas lift systems actually fit in. We are going to talk about two major components of, or the two major subsystems of the gas lift systems. One of them is the side pocket mandrel, and the other one is the gas lift valve. We are going to talk about how we can change out these valves through different intervention tools. Um, we are going to talk about valve latches, running tools, and uh, eventually I will um, end the presentation with a, a brief description of what, what industry uh, regulations, what industry standards are there which govern the design and operation of these gas lift systems. All right, so uh, some of the methods of artificial lift that are more commonly used in the industry are either gas lift, which is a very, very uh, uh, reliable system that is used for many decades now. We have progressive cavity pumps, which you can see uh, right in the middle of the screen. We have hydraulic pumps. Uh, we have beam pumps. You are very, very familiar with this icon of uh, oil and gas industry. Beam pumps are they are universally available uh, globally. Whenever we talk about oil and gas industry, this is something which it, it, it's an icon which you see um, all the time. It's, it's one of the primary methods of artificial lift as well. And then we have ESPs, which are kind of a premium or a more uh, high tier kind of a, a method of artificial lift. Um, among these gas lift systems have their own, they have their own particular niche, they have their own particular area where they are very reliable in terms of lifting that formation fluid all the, all the way to the surface. And today we are going to talk about that. So in among all the uh, artificial lift systems that we use, uh, gas lift systems have been considered very reliable in terms of the cost of maintaining them is very less, the cost of application is very less, and in terms of reliability, they have, they come with, you can, you can have a system that has been deployed for decades without any maintenance. So they, they, they are considered very reliable method. That's why in a lot of oil and gas offshore production, deep sea applications, gas lift is usually considered as one of the primary methods of artificial lift. And, um, but as the, as the name mentioned, you need to have gas lift, gas to have to make this uh, method of artificial lift work. Um, so provision of gas on site is very important. Um, as you can see in the in the in the table um, that I'm been sh I've been sharing, they are really good in terms of operating temperatures. They can go all the way to 400 degree Fahrenheit. Uh, they can lift all the way to three 30,000 barrels of uh, fluid per day. This can include gas. This can this can include oil. This can include water. This can include uh, drilling fluids. Uh, they are really good in terms of gas handling. They are they are fairly good in terms of solids handling. So if you have um, scale or debris in the formation or downhole, uh, they are fairly um, tolerant to handling those solids. Um, they can be serviced through a wire line. So you do not actually need a drilling rig or a work over rig on location. You can actually have a simple servicing vessel or a coil tubing unit that can actually help in uh, servicing those wells. Um, they, they do not have a lot of mobile components and that, make, that makes them really reliable systems. Um, the only moving component or the rotating component that you have is the compressor that is on the surface. And we're going to talk about that in the, in the next slide. So where do all of these artificial lift systems find their application? For a very low flow and low lift applications, we usually have rod pumps, the beam pumps, or the uh, pump jacks that you see uh, very commonly used in the oil and gas world. Um, as you go more, more towards higher flow rate and deeper applications, we try to apply uh, PC pumps. And then, then your submersible pump is kind of, which covers a lot of that envelope there, very good for the high flow rate applications and very deep or very high lift applications. But when you go towards gas lift, they, they are kind of uh, king of artificial lift systems. Uh, they can be used in the very high, uh, up to 50,000 barrels per day kind of applications where um, 
in the deep sea, uh, subsea uh, kind of uh, architecture, um, where your flow rates are very high, where your depths are very high, they are they're considered king, king of that application. So gas lift systems are kind of what covers the umbrella of all of these uh, artificial lift systems. So what is gas lift system? It has been a, it has been a method of choice which has been uh, available for quite some time. It was in, invented in 1865 in Pennsylvania in the Marcellus uh, Shale Formation. It did not gain a lot of popularity until uh, they started having offshore applications in um, in Gulf Coast, in uh, uh, Gulf of Mexico. Um, it it was uh, it was developed by uh, by a company by the name of uh, Castle and Mills. Um, they developed a side pocket mandrel because uh, there are two types of gas lift systems. One is conventional in which you have concentric valves, and the other one is a non-concentric valve. Now, non-concentric valves is more uh, preferred because uh, in that particular um, method, you have a gas lift valves which are off-centered. So you have a through bore access all the way to your uh, well bore. So you can deploy your intervention tools, you can deploy your junk baskets, you can you can run your wire line, and you don't have to worry about the constrictions. Um, so it's very, very preferred around, around different operators around the world. And the other very important uh, aspect of the gas lift systems is that they are very cost effective. All you need is a surface compressor, um, a completion that is compatible with the gas lift system, and, and you can have a very reliable artificial lift methods. They are not very expensive. In like for example, your ESPs, they consume a lot of power. There is a constant uh, operational expenditures that is associated with the uh, ESPs. In terms of gas lift, that operational expenditure is very less. You have a surface compressor that is compressing the gas and injecting it downhole. So all you have to do, you have to factor in is the operational expenditure of maintenance of that um, compressor, and that's pretty much it. Uh, you might have some intervention from time to time, but that is very minimal, and that depends upon your well configuration, your well economics, and how much you want to draw down the formation. So. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are two types of production wells. There is, there is one which is called eruptive, and the eruptive wells are the ones in which the reservoir pressure is enough to push the fluid all the way to the surface. There are other ones which are called non-eruptive, in which the formation pressure or the bottom hole pressure is not enough to push the surface, to, to push the liquid all the way to the surface. Um, this could be the case in terms of a lot of newly developed wells, new completions, or the existing wells uh, which have over the period of time, uh, their production has tapered, the bottom hole pressure have declined. Uh, so it has become from an eruptive well to a non-eruptive well. So for the non-eruptive wells, you need some sort of art artificial lift system. And it, it has become more common now because uh, as we move, go towards more difficult formations, uh, more matured formations, the bottom hole pressure have declined over the period of time. Um, so you need some sort of artificial lift system. And we use artificial lift systems on the non-eruptive wells. So this shows you kind of an overall view of what the gas lift systems looks like and what kind of a surface architecture you need to make it happen. Um, we are going to talk about the downhole downhole components in a in a in a moment, but let's just appreciate what is required all on the surface. You have your uh, producing wells, which are uh, you can see there's a pad of four wells. Uh, you have a production manifold, your oil and gas separator. From here, you will you will push your uh, produce oil either to an oil storage on site or to a pipeline. And then you have uh, the produce water can be disposed through an injection well, and then your produce gas can be pushed to a, 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 a compressor package. From here, you, it can be either transported to uh, to the surface or to the onshore location or to the nearest uh, uh, oil and gas battery, and some of that can be injected back into the reservoir. And that is what we use for gas lifting. The injected gas actually passes through the completion and through certain gas lift valves, it can be used to push the fluid all the way to the surface. And we are going to talk about that in a subsequent slide. So uh, what are the basic principles around the gas lift? Um, you have to be, you have to be 
familiar with two concepts. One of them is hydrostatic pressure and fluid gradient. And hydrostatic pressure in the most simplistic terms is actually the pressure that, that is exerted by the column of fluid. Um, in our case, this is the pressure that is exerted by the column of fluid in the tubing at the casing. And the fluid gradient, which is the pressure exerted by the, uh, by the, by the fluid uh, per foot of vertical length. And what actually happens is that in the gas lift, you inject gas all the way to the surface uh, in a space which is called annulus. Now, what is annulus? Annulus is actually the space between your uh, production tubing, which is in the center, which you can see over here, and your casing. So the space between those, what, what you can see in the, in the black shade, is called annulus. So you would inject your gas through the annulus. It passes through a gas lift valve, which is uh, 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 in a centric component in the completion. Um, and then this gas lift valve, you can see over here, it's, it's, it's not in line with the completion um, center line. It's actually off-centered. Um, and it is deployed in a completion uh, equipment called gas lift matter. We are going to talk about gas lift matter in, in uh, next slide. Um, so the gas will come, it will pass through the gas lift valve, and then it will mix with the formation. And what actually happens is that once you start pumping uh, that gas into the into the formation fluid or the, the fluid that is in the in the tubing, it will start decreasing the specific gravity of that fluid. And once you start decreasing your specific gravity, your bottom hole pressure will decrease, and you have more uh, formation fluid coming into the tubing. When you have more of that formation fluid coming into the into the fluid, it will reduce the density and it will push the, the, the fluid all the way to the surface. So there are a couple of points that are that I mentioned that I, I want to I, I want you to latch on. Um, we try to introduce gas at the deepest point in the completion. And that makes sense, right? You are trying to reduce your bottom hole pressure as much as you can, so that you can have more fluid coming on all the coming all the way to the surface. Um, it is injected through annulus, which is the space between tubing and casing. And as it, it mixes with the with the oil, it reduces the specific specific gravity, thus reducing the gradient because your gradient is directly proportional to your specific gravity. And as it reduces the specific gravity, you have you have reduction in the bottom of the pressure and it pushes the fluid all the way to the surface. So the aim is that we inject as much gas as we can to reduce the bottom hole pressure. And that is what will push the formation fluid all the way to the surface. And I'm going to show you in the next slide how the loading and unloading sequence of a, of a well actually looks like. So to start with, you have no flow. You have a you have a completion, there is no flow, there is still fluid in the in the tubing of the case. Um, and the well is ready to unload, um, and your casing and tubing is full of fluid. There is no flow from the reservoir. You are not getting any flow on the surface, as you can see over here. There is no flow on the surface. Uh, there is nothing that is happening right now. We are not injecting any gas. This is your well in, in, a, in a loaded sequence. So what will happen is that you will inject gas uh, through your annulus, and it will start passing through. So one thing which, before I latch into this concept, one thing which I want to mention is that you have, you can have one val valve in the completion, or you can have multiple valves in the completion. That depends upon your completion design. Uh, in this particular one, you have three uh, gas lift mandrels. That means you have three gas lift valves in this completion. Um, there, is a, there is a one at the top, one, two, three, and four. So what will happen is that you will inject gas from the surface. It will start passing through the first, it will open up the valve and it will pass, start passing through the first gas lift mandrel. Now what happens is that this is the first point where your gas lift has actually commenced, your gas lift has actually started. Um, but at this point of time, only the kill fluid or the dead tubing fluid is being lifted to the surface. And that is very important because once you lift that fluid, your um, your reservoir fluid will have the chance of coming into the tubing and being lifted all the way to the surface. Um, at this point, as, as of what I mentioned, there is no fluid uh, flowing from the formation. But now, um, as you start as you start load, unloading your uh, fluid, um, you have gas pushing that casing fluid uh, all the way through the tubing, and then you start commencing gas lifting through the second gas lift manual. 
And what actually happens is that at this point of time, your back pressure or the, your bottom hole pressure starts decreasing and your formation fluid starts gushing into the, into the production tube. And, and at this point of time, you will have some oil and oil. You have gas, which is, which has, which has, which is coming into the tubing from the, from the get-go when you were injecting through the first gas lift mandrel. But now you have formation fluid, which is oil started coming into the tubing as well. And 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 you keep on you keep on pumping your gas uh, until you go to the very last station or the very last gas lift point. Um, and you you are you are so you are establishing your flow through the first all the way to the third side pocket mandrel. And as you go deeper and deeper, what actually happens is that the gas lift valves are actually set at a particular are set to open at a particular pressure. Um, as the pressure starts. Uh, decreasing at the top, what will happen is that it will close the actual gas lift valve and it will, it will push gas more towards the more deeper uh, uh, installed gas lift valve. So uh, right now you can see that you are injecting gas all the way to the third station of the third gas lift. And it will further reduce your back pressure on the formation. And you keep on doing that sequence until you go to the very very last station or the very last uh, installation of the gas lift valves and gas lift mattress. Uh, at this point of time, you have full flow of the formation fluid all the way to the surface, you have very stable reservoir flow, and, and you keep on doing it. And this is what we call a continuous method of gas lifting. There is another method which is called intermittent, intermittent, intermittent gas, lift, uh, gas lifting, but that's, that's not a very, uh, common uh, method of gas lifting. Mostly we are continuously injecting gas into the formation and continuously lifting that fluid all the way to the surface. Um, now we try to make this happen in one way. So that means that you will have gas coming through the annulus into the valve, uh, mixing with the fluid all the way to the surface. We try not to have uh, the cross communication. That means the tubing fluid going into the cannulus. And that is usually done through a check valve that is installed into gas lift. Valves. So in the slides in which I will discuss the mechanics of the gas lift valves, we're going to talk about the check valve that is made, that is installed to ensure that there is no um, uh, cross communication. And usually what happens is that your very last valve in the, in the completion is usually your orifice valve. That means <clears throat> it is always open. Um, and there is a particular set of orifice that you put in that gas lift valve. And that is to ensure that you have you can control your flow uh, that is coming all the way to the surface. Now, um, there are two, as I mentioned, there are two subsystems of uh, gas lift systems. One of them is called gas lift valve, and one of them is called gas lift mandrel. Gas lift mandrel is just a carrier of the gas lift. Uh, what actually happens is that this, the one which you see on the surface is called, on the, on the, on the slide is called a side pocket mandrel. The reason why it is called side pocket is because, as you can see, it has a pocket for the gas lift valve on the side, hence the side pocket mandrel. Um, we have communication ports that are drilled into the mandrel, and these are the communication ports through which the gas will inject and the gas will go inside the, uh, inside the, inside the valve. The valve is usually installed into this, in, into this pocket, which is a side pocket. Um, the, one of the Primary advantage of, advantages of having a side pocket mandrel is that it will give you a through bore access. That means you will never lose the access to your uh, uh, ID of the tubing. So if you have a wireline plug, if you are setting any plugs, if you are if you are running a wireline tool, logging tool, a sonic tool, uh, it will always ensure that you have a through bore access and um, the gas lift system is not providing any restriction uh, to the application of these tools. Um, some of the common side pocket mandrels are manufactured by Camco, Teledyne, Merla, and Maco. Um, uh, Camco was kind of an inventor of the side pocket mandrel. Um, now, one of the things, one of the flexibility that the gas lift system offers you is that for some reason, if you want to change your valve, if it starts malfunctioning, if you want to change the orifice, you can always run an intervention tool that is run either on a wire line or a stick line, which is called a kickover tool. Now, remember that word very clearly because a kickover tool is, is the one which will 
uh, pull this well, even when the well is, uh, uh, when the completion has been deployed, and it will uh, pull that pull that valve, take it to the surface. Um, you can put a new valve on the kickover tool, and you can uh, run it down hole and install it in the pocket. Uh, we are going to talk about how the running and the pulling sequences work in the subsequent slides. Um, now, what are the uses for the side pocket manuals? They can be used not only for gas lifting, so you can install a gas lift well, but they can be used for various other purposes. You can actually run um, electronic uh, pressure gauges, which can actually measure your downhole temperature, your bottom hole pressure. Uh, you can put your chemical injection valves, so you can actually inject chemicals all the way uh, uh, to the deepest point in, in your completion. And this chemical injection can be for various purposes. It can be to for the scale inhibition or corrosion inhibition. Um, then you can also install dummy valve. Uh, when you install a dummy valve, which is just a plug um, in this pocket, uh, what actually happens is that you actually curtail or stop your gas lifting, and then you can flow your uh, well in a very normal fashion. And then you can also use uh, it to install dump kill valve, and these are effectively to kill the formation or kill the well um, if you want to do any work over that required. Uh, killing up again. Um, I was talking about some of the components or some of the uh, components of the uh, side pocket mandrels. Um, it's a very, very simplistic uh, piece of uh, completion equipment. Um, you have a pocket in which you will install um, a side pocket on which in which you will install a gas lift valve. You have a latch profile. So this latch profile is to make sure that the gas lift valve will remain securely in the pocket and it will not move or it will not uh, it will not be ejected by the formation pressure. So that latch profile is uh, there is a there is a similar profile on the on the latch uh, which is installed on the top of the gas lift valve, which you can see on, over here as well. Uh, this is the latch and this latch you can see a ring over here which is on this uh, latch profile. You have a tool discriminator, which is also called a deflector. Uh, this is to make sure that if there, you have any tools, any wild line tools, any slick line tools that, that are passing through the gas lift uh, mandrel, they do not interfere with, uh, uh, with the gas lift valve. Um, it also serves a second purpose, which is to make sure that you are, when, you are, when you are running your kickover tool to install or pull your gas lift valve, only the kickover tool will access the pocket of the, of the gas lift valve. And one of the one of the component that I will I will ask you to just remember because it plays a very important role when we start talking about um, the pulling and the running of the gas lift valve. It's what we call orienting sleeve. This is like a mule shoe kind of a profile, and 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 that it plays a very important role. It plays a very important role when you are changing the valve during a normal production during a normal gas lifting. It does not play a, a very vital role. Uh, but it is very, very crucial uh, that we have this orienting profile because that is what the side pocket mandrel work uh, when you have to change your valve. Now, we were talking about the changing of the valves, and the changing of the valves is, is, is what gives you the flexibility because you don't have to deploy a drilling rig uh, or you don't have to deploy a drilling rig. Uh, you can actually use a coil tubing unit, a e line unit, or a slick line unit uh, to change your valves. And that's, that's, that's very important, especially when you go to the deep sea uh, or deep water applications, offshore applications, because uh, the cost of deploying a rig all the way to the well is, is, is very high. So you want to have that flexibility that you can actually use a barge with an e line unit or a slick line unit to change this, uh, these valves. So, to do that, we have a tool which is called a takeover tool. This tool is actually run um, mostly on a slick line, but you can also run it on a on an electric line or a wire line. Um, this tool is called a kickover tool. Um, what it actually essentially have is that there is a locating finger right over here, um, and this locator a locating finger is the one which actually locks itself in this uh, mule shoe profile. That's why that new shoe or the orienting sleeve profile is very important. Uh, we have a finger housing, we have a um, couple of these components. And what effectively happens is that you will put your valve over here on the surface. You will run this tool all the way to your gas lift panel. Um, 
you will activate this tool and it will uh, it will install that valve into that uh, gas um, some of the things I, I will just quickly talk about this uh, locating finger this locating finger will go in this orienting profile uh, once it is in this orienting profile what will happen is that this arm which you see at the bottom of the screen it will kick out and it will align with this pocket you can see that it's it's very much similar to the same diameter as pocket. Uh, your valve will be installed at the bottom of this arm. Uh, once you lower this tool, it will deploy the valve in this pocket. And once the latch, which is over here, is in this profile, latching profile, you can pull your tool all the way to the surface. The bottom of the tool is effectively acts as a centralizer and also as a valve catcher. So for some reason, if your valve is unable to latch inside that profile, it does not fall uh, down hole. You have a valve catcher at the end of the kickover tool that can actually catch that valve. Uh, the other components, the other things at the, uh, at the end of the tool is prime, are, are, your, are your centralizing sleeves that will make sure that your tool is always parallel to your gas flux valve. You have your uh, tool catcher um, and your centralizing sleeve, and that's pretty much it. Now, for some of the kickover tools, uh, they have uh, a sucker or thread profile at the top, so you can actually run your adapters and you can even run your uh, uh, your uh, slick line jars, your uh, slick line weight, and it is collected through a slick line all the way to the slick line. Now, how the running um, of it actually works like I've I've talked about it uh, in a in in my subsequent slides, but let's look into this uh, in a bit more detail. Uh, what actually happens is that uh, you will you will make up this tool all the way on the surface. You will make up with the wire line jars. You have your um, your wire line weights, and then your wire line or a slick line connected with the with the slick line unit through a, a lubricator. Uh, you will lower this. To the depth where you know your gas lift uh, valve is installed. Once you reach your target depth, you will pull this tool. Once you pull this tool, uh, this locating finger, which I was mentioning uh, in my previous slide, it will orientate and it will go in that mule shoe or a mule shoe profile or an orienting sleeve. What's in the, what's in the once it is in the orienting sleeve, uh, you give it slight overpull. And you do a slight overpull, what will happen is that this arm, which was actually resting inside the kickover tool, it will kick and it will align with the, with the valve pocket. Uh, right now, we are running the gas lift valve in this uh, gas lift mandrel. So once it aligns with the pocket, what you do is you will lower your tool. Once you lower your tool, it will insert this gas lift valve into the pocket of the gas lift mandrel. So right now, you can see that. Uh, it has been installed in the gas lift uh, mandrel. It is securely, the valve is securely in that pocket. Um, once it is securely in the pocket, you just jar it a couple of times uh, just to make sure that the latching profile is latched in, the latch, the latch in the uh, gas lift valve is that latched into the profile in the mandrel. Uh, once it's locked into the position, you will actually pull this kickover tool all the way to the surface and if that's pretty much it, your valve is installed now. Um, similar way, if you want to uh, pull this valve, um, you install a pulling tool on this uh, kickover tool on the surface, you make it up, you run it the similar way as you have installed your valve. Um, once it kicks over, it will latch onto the, the pulling tool will latch onto the, the, the latch on top of the, of the gas lift valve and it will pull it all the way to the surface. Now, we were talking about the latches. These latches uh, have two aims. Uh, one of them is to make sure that the gas lift valve is actually latched or locked into the pocket of the gas lift mandrel. Um, other thing they want to make sure is that they secure the top of the, of the valve so that uh, if you have any tools running past the side pocket mandrel, they do not interfere with the valve. Um, there are two types of latches. Uh, or there are two sizes of latches. One is called a one inch latch, which is actually installed on, on top of the one inch uh, valve. Uh, when I say a one inch valve or a one inch latch, that means 
uh, their nominal diameter is one inch. And then you have uh, a two inch uh, latch as well, which uh, one and a half inch latch, which is actually installed on a one, one and a half inch um, well. So these are a couple of latches that are used on one and a half, one and a half inch uh, valves. The most of the common ones which, you, which we see is what we call the uh, RK type latch, uh, which is installed on a one and a half inch valve. Um, it has a simpler latching lug over here that will go into that latching profile inside the mandrel and secure the valve into that profile. Um, sometimes we also have a cam type of a profile. Uh, in which this cam profile or this cam will actually lock into that profile um, and secure the valve in the pocket. Um, and that's pretty much it. Sometimes we have uh, debris rings or O-rings at the top of the land that's just to make sure that there is, if there is any debris that is passing through the side pocket mandrel, it does not get lodged into that, uh, into that latch because once it does, it, it makes the pulling of the valve bit difficult. Now, uh, I would like to talk about the gas lift valves because gas lift valves are the ones which actually do most of the work. Uh, they are primarily being used to inject the gas into the formation fluid um, or, the, or the tubing fluid. So there are different types that are available and, and the type of valve that you will select is primarily dependent on where are you deploying that valve, uh, on which station you are de deploying that valve because as I mentioned earlier, uh, the, the most bottom, the bottom most valve is usually a orifice valve. That means that it's always open, and there is a certain size of orifice um, that is installed in that valve. And all the valves that are deployed on the stations above that deepest stations are called injection pressure operated valves. And there are two types of injection pressure operated valves. Um, there is one which is called casing, casing pressure sensitive. That means it will be operated based on the fluctuations or changes in your casing pressure. And there are tier tubing pressure sensitive that will be operated by the tubing pressure. Now you can, in most of the gas shift installations, you have, you are injecting gas into your annulus, right? And you are producing through your tubing. Um, sometimes you can, you can always install, uh, inject your gas through the tubing and produce through your casing. However, it's not very preferred method of artificial lift. Um, in 70 to 80% of the installations, you will always see uh, a, a, a casing deployed or a, or a casing pressure sensitive. Um, however, both of these valves are used to unload the column of fluid um, while incorporating orifice valves as a working valve. Now, orifice valves, as I mentioned earlier, they are always open. There is a small orifice. We are going to talk about that in, the, in a subsequent slide. The orifice size is determined based on how much fluid you want to produce. So, so the smallest one is inch and an eighth. And as you go towards a higher one, um, you increase them in the size of inch, inch and 16. Um, so bigger orifice size is made for more production and smaller orifice size is made for a smaller production. And there is always a check valve in the nose that will make sure that there is no cross communication. Dummy valve, as I mentioned earlier, is just to block the, uh, the pocket in the side pocket mantle. Um, so in case you want to stop your gas lifting, you want to um, you want to deploy some other method of artificial lift, you can put your dummy valve and they will plug any communication between casing and the tube. Um, this is what a dummy valve will actually look like. Um, it's just a block of metal. There are seals at the top and the bottom, and they're just to make sure that uh, there is no fluid going past the, the gas lift valve. And this is just plugging that port. Now, uh, what an injection pressure operated valve actually uh, looks like it's uh, injection pressure operated valve is actually one of the most complicated piece, piece of the gas lift because it has moving components as i mentioned earlier. Um, what actually happens is that you have bellows and then you have a dome at the top um, this dome is actually charged with nitrogen at a certain pressure um, the pressure that is applied in this dome or this dome is actually set to is based upon your injection pressure so 
if you are injecting your gas at 500 psi or 1000 psi, uh, you will set your dome pressure based on that. Um, we have bellows. These bellows effectively acts as a spring um, because, as if you can, if you can see over here, this is this is exactly what is actually shown over here in the most simplistic uh, terms. We have a ball which is actually sitting on a seat. You can see over here, ball sitting on a seat, uh, and this this ball and seed are actually attached with the stem. The stems move up and down. Um, when it moves up, it opens the valve, so your fluid can actually go through this orifice into your formation. Um, and when uh, the, the pressure drops, um, this stem will actually close this valve and there is no more injection. And regardless whether it's a, a casing pressure sensitive valve or a tubing pressure sensitive valve, um, all of them actually work on one main principle. And what happens is that when your valve is closed and you want to open it, there are two pressures acting on that valve. The pressure which is coming from casing or tubing, which is acting on the bellows, uh, and there is a pressure which is between the cavity between um, the stem uh, or the ball um, and the back check. So there are two pressures uh, acting on that valve. Um, when, uh, when your casing pressure or your tubing pressure increases, uh, and if, if when it surpasses the pressure that is applied in the dome, it will push uh, the stem uh, away from the seat and you can have uh, gas injection. But when this pressure produces, um, uh, the pressure in the bellows uh, or in the dome will overcome the pressure that is applied by through the tubing and then your stem will push the ball back into that, uh, into that seat and it will close the valve, and it will curtail your gas lifting. So uh, very simple, not very, not a lot of moving components except the ball, which is at the very bottom. You can, you can see over here, uh, a stem, bellows, dome, and your charging port. Uh, that's pretty much it. We have, a, as I mentioned earlier, there's a back check at the very bottom. Uh, this back check is to make sure that uh, there is only a one-way communication. There is no um, second communication. So, uh, so these are your injection ports. The gas will come through this, push the stem up to the top. Then it has the, the flow path to go through this uh, seat. It will go through this flow path. It will push this back check below. Uh, and when it pushes this back check below, it has the flow path to go through this nose into the formation. Very simple. Uh, this is just an enlarged view of that uh, of that stem ball stem seat assembly. Uh, the seat is installed in the body of the gas lift valve. Your injection ports are over here. Um, this is your this is your valve. This is your stem. These are the packings. These packings are to ensure that there is no communication between the uh, uh, there is no communication past uh, the gas lift valve. Usually your uh, valve. Uh, ball is made of tungsten carbide because it does see a lot of um, uh, open and closing cycles. And then your back check. Your back check is simply a check valve um, with a with a slight dome at the top. Uh, when your uh, gas comes and hits this check, it will push this check. You can see there is a spring over here. It will push this check uh, below to sit in this cavity, and then it can go into the reservoir. Orifice wells. Orifice wells are very simplest piece of these uh, of the gas lift system. Um, so you have your injection pressure or IPO valve at the top stations, at the, and the very deepest station you have your orifice valve. And the orifice valve is nothing except there is a small port that is drilled into that uh, uh, into that seat. Uh, that port can be from inch and an eight all the way to um, uh, uh, three by eight. Um, depending upon how much gas you are injecting and, and it acts as a controlling feature. Um, so you can have a simple port that is drilled to the seat or it can have a venturi type of profile um, in the valve. Um, what are, so gas lift is actually governed by API standards and ISO standards. Um, the API standard that actually governs the manufacturing uh, application and material selection of the side pocket manuals is called API 19G1. 
uh, or ISO standard 170-78-1. Uh, similarly, just like side pocket measures, we have an API 19G2 for the gasket valve or a flow control device. And then for the kickover tools and latches, we have API 19G3, which governs uh, the manufacturing standards, the material selection, um, the design standards, and also the application standards for the gaslit system. Um, the gaslit systems can be designed validated, validated to different validation uh, grades. Um, it can be V1, which is the highest grade used in offshore applications, to V3, which is used for more onshore applications, on land uh, applications. And then similarly, if the manufact, if the if the client or a uh, uh, customer is actually asking for a factory acceptance test, there are different grades of factory acceptance test he can request for, all the way for F1, which is the most stringent standard, to F3, which is the least stringent standard. Um, and do you have uh, quality control plan standards as well, which is Q1 to Q2. Um, 